Chapter 4 The Three-Part Attack Imagine a scorpion. It has two independent claws configured opposite of each other, used to agitate, distract, injure, and subdue its opponents. Of a very different design, the scorpion has a third weapon, a long tail with a deadly venomous stinger that it uses only at the right moment for the purpose of delivering a paralyzing and debilitating blow. The two claws almost compete in the same area, badgering its enemy from opposite sides. The moments the claws have the complete attention of the enemy, the stinger comes in fast and delivers the deadly accurate injection, ending the struggle. The scorpion gives us a battle plan to emulate. We need to have the above ground anarchist network on the one side represented by one claw, and we need the underground sabotage network on the other side represented by a separate claw. Then seemingly unrelated to either is the stinger with its irregular warfare, always present, patiently waiting for the right moment to strike a selective blow. Consider the scorpion as more than a three-part killing machine. The adult scorpion, an arachnid related to spiders, will have as many as 12 eyes, 10 of which may operate independently, and in addition to its actual eyes, it may have areas of its body that are not considered eyes, but still detect light and motion. So you could say the scorpion has a variety of viewpoints, all processing different types of information. The scorpion lacks the kind of central nervous system that humans have, so it has nothing like the decision-making brain we see in mammals. Rather, it has a series of nerve bundles attached to specific muscles and organs sending multiple impulses independent of the other muscles and organs. So, for example, one or more eyes may send messages to a pincher directing its motions and actions in a fight without input from other eyes that may be sending messages to the other pincher directing it independently during the same fight. This direct connection between its pinchers and its eyes can communicate messages much faster than in mammals where all messages have to travel to the brain for decision making and central planning of all actions. In a very real sense, the scorpion possesses a decentralized and even to a certain extent a distributed decision making system, making it far more of an effective fighter than a mammal of equal size limited by central planning. Considering the example of the scorpion, it is my intent in this writing to bring together lessons learned from 150 years of anarchist writings, established military strategy, and balanced wisdom in order to guide a very disjointed, disorganized, and confused movement to become a more focused cause for freedom. It has been said, When I was a child, I thought as a child. I spoke as a child, and I acted like a child. But a time came in my life when I was no longer a child, and it became prudent for me to put away childish things. That old saying is not a combination of childhood. It is an admonition to be the grown-up that we are. The wise remember the foolishness of their childhood and grow from it. At some point, key anarchists will see the need for their movement to mature and put away childish behavior. They will understand that they must stop continuously embracing stunts formulated by children vying for attention. When that time comes, an operational field manual such as this one will come in handy. That's not to say this manual is perfect nor exhaustive. It is simply a step towards leaving behind childish thinking and childish beliefs and embracing the hard, honest facts of adulthood. Santa Claus, or insert your favorite great man here, will not magically appear to bring you gifts like secession, a night watchman government, a gold standard with full banking reserve, or a miraculous redistribution of wealth for all the happy workers of the world. Fantasies and dreams of sugar plums, no matter how carefully formed, will not set you free from the deeply evil men who profit from the state. Waving signs that say, End the Fed, will not somehow inspire the men to whom governments of the world owe some $57 trillion to suddenly play fair. The men who control and profit from the current system will not one day realize the people of the world don't want to be their slaves and just close up their banking cartels and slip off into the good night on their yachts. The hard reality is, as history has displayed for us far too often, those with power will murder on an unimaginable scale to maintain and expand their monopoly of power. 
Now that those powers that be control nuclear arsenals and have proven the propensity to use them on civilian populations, it is childish beyond belief to expect humans will ever achieve freedom while those men of power live. When you add into the equation the fact that these powerful men possess underground bunker systems, including long-term seed storage, and they have openly published their desire to control or drastically reduce the human population, why would any clear-thinking adult entertain the notion that simply winning an election, or drafting a new constitution, or passing a law, or repealing a law, or demanding governments behave, will stop these monsters or the beasts they serve? And it is nothing but sheer cowardice to accept some slight pacification of one kind or another while passing the slavery on to your children and grandchildren. In fact, the over 250 million humans murdered by their own governments during the last century, that number does not include wars, could not have happened had our grandfathers and their grandfathers stood up and killed the state rather than what they did which was to take the same path used today by the current liberty movement and all those who attempt to make the state kinder, gentler, and more palatable to the masses. I stated earlier that I respect pacifists, and I stand by that. However, I don't agree with their philosophy. I do recognize that there exists a consistency in the philosophy of many pacifists, for example, Jainism, and a very few Christians seem very consistent but in most pacifists that I have encountered, there are glaring inconsistencies. Unfortunately, pacifism of the glaringly inconsistent type has deeply influenced many of the more famous liberty personalities. Of all people, students of libertarianism should understand the relationship between rights and responsibilities. For example, I have a right to my property, including my life, so long as I respect the same right of property in others. However, if I fail to respect the property rights of another person, I relinquish the equal right of my property. Libertarians usually understand this and recognize it as the basis of the morality of self-defense. So if someone attempts to murder me, thereby attempting to destroy the property of my life, I can rightfully destroy the property of their life because they relinquish their right of that property when they attempted aggression upon me. Again, most people understand this naturally, even if they never thought out its philosophical basis. Where many people have fallen down is in their own responsibility to maintain their rights. And I believe this is where many libertarians have become confused by their exposure to inconsistent pacifists. The libertarians I am referring to here theoretically agree that self-defense is morally acceptable, and most do not call themselves pacifists but they fail to arm themselves in any real manner, and if they were forced to defend themselves, they would have no idea how to do so. What they fail to realize is that there exists an inherent responsibility to self-defense that works hand-in-hand -hand with their right of property. Inconsistent pacifists and waves of propaganda from the state have systematically taught people to expect protection to come from some outside authority or entity, rather than the individual being responsible for their own security. This is what I was referring to when I said that, had our forefathers responded correctly to the advance of the state, the 20th century would not have been a century marked by constant war and genocide. That does not excuse those acting on behalf of the state and the murders of hundreds of millions of people. It only means that there was a responsibility to stop the state and our forefathers failed in their duty to protect us, their posterity. We now hold that responsibility. If we fail to take the actions that are required to protect ourselves, our property, and our posterity, that doesn't justify state actors who steal and murder, but it does place shame on our heads for the generations to come who we have failed to protect. Having established these uncomfortable facts, the grown-up anarchist is no longer left with the option to play nice and hope for the best. And yet, true anarchism is and must be a philosophy of peace. This seemingly contradictive position has but one solution. Since the zero aggression principle allows for violence in the pursuit of self-defense, those who are suited for such action must train and prepare for selective ethics-based decapitation of the beast. Those acting on behalf of their state masters who actively murder, rape, rob, and extort 
have relinquished their right of property in proportion to the amount they have aggressed, and those of us with the knowledge and the skill have a responsibility to do something about it. To say it more clearly, riflemen must have a place at our table, but their actions must be principled, patient, and carefully directed. Immature stunts are not becoming of men of action. A true warrior will not be found parading about boasting of his prowess, waving flags and pronouncing lines in the sand, while demanding marches on Washington or occupying some park bench or ranger station. The real warrior knows that fortifying sandcastles while playing army games in the forest are as childish as chalking sidewalks, yelling through megaphones, and whining about conspiracies. So if the riflemen expect to take their place at the table with the adults, they need to grow up and begin earning that place. They need to stop following self-glorifying leaders who entice them into open confrontations with the authorities. They need to understand the purpose of camouflage and stop metaphorically decorating themselves in flashing neon while screeching their intentions like a drunken redneck on a party boat. Likewise, the above-ground liberty activists will need to grow up and stop acting like spoiled children over who is being mean to whom on social networks while expending their energy and resources trying to get governments to give them permission to use cannabis. There are more important things than arguing with communists about the meaning of the word capitalism and debating fascists about the veneration of flags while whining about social justice warriors. The time has come to put aside the games of your childhood and get into the battle that is about to sweep across humanity. As you will read later in this manual, it's time for the above-ground network to embrace its seven-part job and begin the heavy lifting it will need to do to survive what the state will throw at us before it gives up the ghost. Childish thinking and obsolete methods may have served a purpose at some time, but one thing is clear. We have moved on and childish thinking and obsolete methods are, or should be, dead. Once a thing dies, it must be disposed of quickly or it will rot, stink, and spread disease. Thus we build the fires and throw the past into the flames so that we may leave behind the pain and failures of days gone by and embrace the onslaught of challenges that the future brings. Speaking of destruction, funeral pyres, and the future, the state will not die easy. Anyone who tells you so is likely selling you snake oil while fishing for a monthly donation to their feel-good cause. The state will thrash about wail, and strike out at anything it can reach before it dies. It will eat its own children and burn its own house before it accepts its demise. Make no mistake, the death of the beast will be an ugly sight to behold. When it dies its death, it will burn a memory in the minds of humans that they will not quickly forget. The death pangs of the great dragon will scar not only humanity, but the earth itself in such a manner that a thousand years of erosion will not heal the wounds. And the longer we put off this fight, the more powerful the beast becomes and the more devastating those wounds will be. Chapter 4, Section 1 Above Ground Activists The peaceful above ground activists are now, have been, and must always be the backbone of our cause. They are our public voice and our public image. They range in description from the quiet elderly lady who has supported peace and freedom for years in her own humble way, to the college professor who will likely never reach a level of real influence in the university system due to his dedication to truth and freedom. The podcaster faithfully sharing his voice with any who will listen, and the brave freedom fighter who uses every opportunity to film the police or any other authoritarians as they beat down the innocent. The independent journalist who refuses to kowtow to authority, to the stalwart grandfather who uses wisdom in his own peaceful life as an example for his family. These and others are all examples of the activism that can provide the model of the world that we can someday possess. These activists are our sales force in the marketplace of ideas, offering a better worldview and a better product than our enemy, the state. Ultimately, it's the market that will choose the timing of the death of the state. Currently, there's a thriving market demand for the state. Most people don't understand the alternatives, nor can they imagine a world without monopolized aggression. Also, people tend to be loyal to brand-specific products, and the state is the brand Mother Trusted, the brand Gramps fought for during the war, 
and it's the only brand they ever hear about on their television. Most people have very little exposure to the violent, bloody monster that is hidden under the surface of every encounter with government agents. Many people are either employed directly or indirectly by governments, or they have close friends or relatives who are. And in the process of voting, along with the propaganda that goes with it, exists for the purposes of convincing the individual that when they vote, they create government. So when they think of government, they think of themselves or their uncle or their neighbor. When they hear about some cop beating a pregnant woman to death or shooting an old man or choking a child, they assume that that person did something to deserve such actions. How could they think otherwise? How could they condemn government when they believe they are government? This is what I mean when I say there is a market demand for the state. This explains why, when someone finally feels the fangs of the beast in their own flesh, they are shocked and horrified, and they don't understand why their precious government is behaving like it is. They'll repeat over and over, I have faith in the system, I'm innocent, and I'll have my day in court. They'll chant their mantra, trying to change reality through their faith, or they'll insist that it's just this court, this bureaucrat, this agency, this city, this police chief that's the problem, and if we could just let someone in government know about this mix-up, then government would fix this problem. This explains why an otherwise rational mother would intentionally call the police to help with her out-of-control child. Most of the time, these sad people will maintain their faith in this myth right up to the point that the obedient government servant ends the life of their innocent child. This sad process is very much like what happens when a powerful predator grabs a small, weak animal, and the animal goes limp and seems to faint. It's our job to wake them up and encourage them to bite back. The state, for some 600 generations, has taught humans to act like a herd rather than individuals. We see the predator grab one of us, and rather than brave men and women instantly falling upon the predator, beating him senseless, we pull back and bleat or run away. We close our curtains. We change lanes. We blame the victim. But there are some that are slowly remembering who we are. There are those among us who are remembering that we are not a herd to be sheared or eaten. We are individuals capable of empathy for our fellow humans. And we are beginning to stand up to the predators. Currently, this process involves things like filming police thuggery and then exposing that thuggery on social media. Things like picking through news stories from the mainstream media and exposing the lies. Like pointing out to coworkers the travesty of taxation and the inefficiencies of central planning. Like speaking out against wars and the criminals who run the military industrial complex. Simply teaching others about the invisible tax cult inflation and how fractional reserve central banking is a scam. Parents raising unregistered, unschooled children who understand the trivium and can explain Diocletian's problem-reaction solution. Also, parents working with other parents in support of their efforts. These people are springing up around the world. They are the above-ground network of activists, and they are no longer allowing themselves to be herded. Instead, they are making themselves heard. The above-ground activists predict the failures of the state, advertise the lies and failings of the state, and guide those who wish to learn about a greater understanding of peace, liberty, and a free life. But wait, doesn't that mean they're evangelists? Not at all. You see, there is a vast gulf between evangelists and advertising or sales. Sure, many of the tactics are similar and they share certain characteristics, but the similarity is superficial. First, there is always a level of fanaticism involved in evangelism. High emotions mixed with a dynamic personality, topped off with just a shot of over-the-top showmanship, and you have an evangelist. Your typical evangelist can sing a good song, tap out a spiffy dance, but rarely is founded in consistent principles, logic, and reason. They almost always know the basic talking points, but they have almost never delved deeper than the surface on any doctrine. They seek the big emotional conversion. Shouting from the stage with a flash of fame, and the passing of the collection plate, they swoop their congregation off its feet and impart a miracle of the emotions that will hopefully last until the next performance and the next passing of the collection plate. These people should be avoided, no matter how they make you feel. The second problem, in regards to the evangelist, 
is his tendency to be a proselytizer. He tends not to be satisfied by simply helping those who are looking for directions, but he seems to want to rush onto the highways of life and stop traffic so he can tell everyone the way to get to the locations he thinks they should be heading towards. Typically, the evangelist's flamboyance and showmanship are only overshadowed by his incredible assumptions of self-importance. He doesn't just want to sell his goods, he wants everyone to want him. His primary product is himself, and his message is secondary at best, although usually the message comes in a distant third in importance after his stage performance. Again, we don't need these people. They are cheerleaders, have little understanding of, and no effect on the actual game. One may ask, if we don't emphasize evangelical recruiting, how will our numbers ever grow to the point that we can have a real impact? This question typically assumes two fallacies. The first and worst being the fallacy that we need a majority or we need vast numbers to win. We don't. Democracy be damned. We will never have a majority. We shouldn't care about a majority. And we don't need a majority. Market thinking isn't about majorities. Let the collectivist worry about majorities. We only need a better product, and we already have that. The second fallacy is the assumption that it is our job to recruit anarchists. It is not our job to recruit anarchists. Humans are born anarchists. It's our true nature. Tricks fool people into believing in the state. And as long as those people are comfortable in their pods clicking the feed bar, you will never be able to truly convert them to freedom. And again, we don't need to. The failings of the state do a far better job of waking up the anarchist spirit in people than any two-bit, soapbox, YouTube preacher ever has or ever could. Selling a product to those who are looking for that very product is vastly easier and more rewarding than evangelism. We're talking about the difference between religious fanaticism and market demand. The word evangelist comes from the word angel and literally means divinely sent messenger. Again, we don't need them. Speaking of divinely sent messengers, the hard truth is that we don't need any beloved elderly leader and former politician from Texas selling us more politics as a path to freedom any more than we need a great philosopher from Canada to enlighten us and indoctrinate us into his internet hate your mother cult. Politicians and cult leaders of any kind are worse than the cheerleading evangelists. If your version of liberty depends on a weekly message from any great man, then you are doing it wrong and this book is not aimed at you. The state is the great recruiter of anarchists. Having an intellectually stimulating conversation with your fellow polo players at the country club on a Sunday afternoon, or the internet version of that scenario played out on social media, may create a theoretical anarchist. My experience has consistently shown that these theoretical anarchists get a big thrill out of changing their online profile to include an anarchist flag and adding some phrase to their header that includes the word voluntarism or agorism. But the moment there's a boots on the ground test of these theoretical anarchists, they'll start to puke status blather like beer spewing from a freshman on frat pledge night. The reason for this phenomenon is complex and unnecessary to evaluate here. For the purpose of this manual, all we need to keep in mind is that the state does the job that rhetorical hoop jumping simply can't accomplish. Telling a person about the boot of the state may stimulate them intellectually, but when an officer friendly actually drags their child out of a car and beats him half to death, the change of heart is real and permanent. Our job is to guide that change of heart and encourage others to be empathetic. The state is its own worst enemy. It will kill itself. The question is, will we let it live long enough to take all of us out with it when it goes? Right now you should be asking, short of having everyone's child sacrificed to the state to prove we're right about the state, what can we do? Chapter 4, Section 1, Part 1 The Seven-Part Job the above ground network seven part job in order of priority. Number one, provide for yourself and your family. Dependence is the opposite of independence. The optimum situation is to secure an income stream that doesn't depend on the state. However, 
If providing for your family means a government job that doesn't require you to directly aggress upon the innocent, then you have to do what you have to do to survive. Not everyone has the luxury of an optimum situation. So first provide as best you can. Number two, strive for consistent principled behavior in your own life. To steal a phrase, rather than focusing on the splinter in your neighbor's eye, you should make sure there's not a log in your own. If you believe what you say, you will live it. If you aren't living what you say, you don't believe it. Living a principled life is a reward of its own. You don't have to wait for some coming glory or some pie in the sky. When you look in the mirror and you know the person looking back is genuine, and when you close your eyes at night knowing you have been true to yourself, you will live a happier life. Number three, prepare for the systematic failure of the state Beans, Band-Aids, Bitcoin, Bullion, and Bullets. Survivalists and preppers have endured concentrated defamation by believers in the state. This fact alone means we should take note of their activities because they're doing something that scares statists. That's not to say we should believe every foil hat wearing wacky doodle with a survival website or podcast. We shouldn't. Some of them are seriously disjointed and some of them are pure con men running scams on the gullible. But being connected to the prepper community and being prepared for a variety of natural or man-made disasters is never a bad idea. Having a disaster plan and having a get-out-of-dodge plan should be standard operating procedure. Also, having a skill set that includes some survival and do-it-yourself abilities is never a bad thing. For example, every parent should know some basic first aid. Number four. Help those who you can help and let go of those whom you cannot help. Emergency workers are trained in triage so that they may assign the priority of treatment based on the degree of injuries or illnesses of a large number of patients. For me, the most difficult part of triage is when you recognize the patient's condition is such that you cannot save them, and helping them will prevent you from helping someone else. You don't want to walk away, but you can't stay. Some simply cannot be saved. That's not to say you must shun family or friends. It doesn't mean you should defu anyone. It means you must come to grips with the fact that some will never leave the mental comfort of slavery. They will cling to their chains to their last breath. Accept it and move on with your life. It's not your job to force slaves into freedom. Number five. Expose the evil and lies of the state as you speak the truth in the face of power. One of the hardest things a person can do is stand on the truth when the world around you is swimming in lies. One of the bravest things a person can do is speak truth in the face of power. Some state this phrase as, speak truth to power. But as others have shown, that statement is flawed as it indicates that we should seek to change the minds of those in political power by influencing them with our words. We should not. Attempting to influence those who hold political power to do our will morally places us in the same category as every other person who uses the political means to achieve their goals. Speaking truth in the face of power indicates that we are speaking in spite of the threat we face. We are not speaking to power. We are speaking truth to posterity, and the powers be damned. Number six, publicly disassociate yourself from the underground, denouncing all acts of aggression. This requires a delicate balance. There are times when we can carefully take a lesson from our enemy. A myriad of politicians over the last few thousand years have turned double talk into an art form. By that, I mean answering a direct pointed question by talking around the topic while boldly announcing some ethical point that is very similar to the question but doesn't directly address the question. In doing this, one can avoid telling a lie while avoiding the question. For example, if the topic of violent anarchist causes someone to accuse you of supporting violence, you can explain the zero aggression principle, or non-aggression principle, if you prefer that terminology. And you can further explain that some people who call themselves anarchists are actually communists and socialists, and they do tend towards violence and destruction, since they don't have any respect for property ownership. However, peaceful anarchists embrace the zero-aggression principle, so we reject all initiation of aggression, 
and we respect the property of peaceful people. When you take that path, deception may be employed, and some say there is no difference between deception and a lie, but that is a matter for the individual to decide for their situation. However, if you actually discipline yourself to avoid acts of aggression and commit yourself to peaceful means, this task of dissociation becomes much easier. But no matter the method, there must be a public disassociation between peaceful activism and the underground. Number 7. Safely Engage in Direct Activism Things like filming the police, podcasting, or other activities, or quietly providing support for the underground according to your abilities and resources. That support doesn't necessarily require money or direct contact. There are many things the individual may do to support the underground without directly interacting with those activists. Again, your imagination is a required tool in this endeavor. Or, if you have carefully examined yourself and you are one of the few uniquely suited for direct involvement in the underground movement, then pursue that path with care and wisdom. Chapter 4, Section 1, Part 2 Film the Police While You Can Filming police in America is an important form of activism right now, but this situation is temporary. Governments worldwide, including the American government, have or will shut this window the moment they think they can get away with it. Currently, there are several great organizations who are emphasizing the importance of filming the police, and they're training more and more people on how to safely do so. In America, these activists have given the state its most serious bloody nose of modern times. Right now, the U.S. government is stuck with old legal decisions and definitions that force it to not only allow the recording of police, but to actually protect those who are bold enough to do so. But as I said, that will rapidly change. Either courts will simply shift their legal protections away from those doing the filming, or what is more likely, some grand event will take place and the media and the full force of its propaganda wing will descend on the activists, demonizing them. In all likelihood, this will be some kind of big tragic event somehow caused by someone filming the police, and most likely it will involve the deaths of police or perhaps even children. Of course this event will be staged, or if real, perhaps entirely orchestrated by the state for the purpose of shifting public opinion towards condemning those who film the police. An aspect of the solution to this terrible tragedy will be a federal level government emphasis on police forces filming themselves. Vast amounts of federal funding will assure a solution to this horrible event. Maybe even a whole new department of federal employees will be hired to film the police for us. In reality, of course, government filming themselves only means more surveillance on the public and more police control of the actual recordings produced. Police will get better at producing fake videos and the bulk of the public will buy the ruse without question. The two action items here are, one, get as many activists filming police as possible while preparing those activists for the propaganda storm that will hit when the false flag event happens. Two, prepare for the time to come when it will be illegal to film the police. The filming must continue after it becomes illegal, but it will need to take a much more clandestine approach. If you just read that last paragraph and thought to yourself, if we know a false flag event is coming and will likely be staged or orchestrated, why not just expose it as fake when it happens? Fear not, friend. There is already an army of activists waiting with bated breath for each new false flag event so that they can be the one exposing its fraud. We are well represented in that field of battle. For more information, just do an internet search for the phrase crisis actor. However, the bulk of the public will believe the government lies no matter how poorly constructed and no matter how carefully debunked. What about filming after the state forbids it? The black market exists only because the white market has become dangerous or forbidden. The same is true with activism. We can't allow laws and thuggery to determine our path. We must do what must be done. Chapter 4, Section 2 Fictional Beings and Their Property Join me in a thought exercise. The Setup We understand that according to consistent libertarian philosophy, 
every human has the exact same rights as every other human. So a child has the same right of property as an adult. Humans own themselves and have the right to own other property that they have rightfully come to possess. We believe that two people may engage in voluntary transaction, transferring the rightful ownership of property from one party to the other, and no one else may rightfully interfere. Libertarians also believe that unowned property can rightfully be homesteaded. This is not an exhaustive explanation of libertarian property theory, but it is suitable for this thought experiment. Phase 1 With the above being the case, let us consider Sally, a child who owns a ball. Sally was given the ball by her mother, Betty, who purchased the ball from a market. The ownership of the ball has not been in question up to the time that Sally decided to give the ball to her imaginary friend, Canada. Sally imagines Canada as an intelligent nine-foot half-zebra, half-ape creature wearing a clown outfit. Sally deeply believes in Canada, believes she has relinquished ownership, and believes she no longer owns the ball. It's Canada's ball, and Sally won't touch it. Question number one. Can the fictional creature Canada rightfully own the ball? Phase two. Every aspect of the above still remains except Sally is joined in her fiction by Billy, her real-life neighbor who also believes in Canada. Question number two. Does the union of Sally and Billy in their belief in the fictional being Canada change the ownership of the ball? Phase three. Every aspect of the above still remains except Sally's mother, Betty, also believes in Canada. Question number three. Does the authority of Betty, along with the union of Sally and Billy and their belief in the fictional being Canada, change the ownership of the ball? Phase 4. This phase has a dramatic change. Sally's mother Betty stole the money she used to buy the ball. She is an outstanding pickpocket, and over the course of a day of theft, she stole money from 73 people, totaling $418. Betty has no idea who those people were, and it's impossible to find out who they were or to return their share of the stolen money. With that money, Betty purchased groceries, gasoline, the ball for Sally, and she ate lunch at a restaurant, tipping the waiter generously. Upon leaving the restaurant, Betty saw a homeless man picking through a trash can, so she gave the man a $20 bill. Every other aspect of the story remains the same. Sally gave the ball to Canada, while Billy and Betty both believe in Canada. Question number four. Who owns the ball? Let me rephrase the question. Can an unrealistic, fictional, non-human entity own property purchased with untraceable stolen money, and does Betty's charity affect the question of property ownership? If, at this point, you would argue that the fictional person Canada actually owns a ball, then our conversation would be over. I wouldn't bother attempting a debate with someone who believes such outlandish fantasies. However, if you don't believe Canada can rightfully own property, why would you believe an equally ridiculous, unrealistic, fictional, non-human entity called the United States government can own property? But wait, there's more! Phase crazy. Canada is no longer named Canada. Canada is now named General Energy. Sally, Billy, and Betty believe they work for General Energy, or GE, as they call it. The U.S. government has issued a slip of paper that declares GE a legal, quote-unquote, person. GE receives millions of dollars in stolen money, or taxes, from the U.S. government every year in government contracts, and in return, Sally, Billy, and Betty make guns that GE sells to the U.S. government. The U.S. government then uses those guns to collect the taxes that it pays to GE for more guns. Betty, using the legal authority granted by the U.S. government, uses GE's money to buy a ball for GE. Question number five. Now who rightfully owns the ball? The consistent libertarian should always have the same answer. The ball is unowned property. Anyone may rightfully homestead it and do with it as they please because imaginary fictional beings can't own property in the real world. 
This principle is not changed by the number of people believing the fiction, nor by the authority of people believing the fiction, nor by their acts of charity. And just because some old farts who call themselves justices or any other gang of delusional people with made-up titles of glory use enforcer thugs to beat, cage, or kill anyone who disagrees, it doesn't change the reality of what is right and what is wrong, nor is reality changed by the passage of time. So just because your father and his father before him believed in a nine-foot-tall, half-zebra, half-ape named Canada, that doesn't make it so. There are those who will attempt to argue that somehow the ball belongs to all of us. These people believe in, quote-unquote, public property. They will use convoluted collectivist property rights theories to show that since we are all robbed, then we all have ownership in the ball. To make this argument, you must abandon libertarian principles and, largely, logic itself. You have to create an imaginary world where you can theoretically own something without ever having seen it, touched it, or possibly even been aware of its existence. You would have to be able to own property that you can't possess or interact with in any way and that you have no influence as to whether others may or may not interact with it. So then the question becomes, can you own a ball that you don't know exists and that someone else can play with or destroy at their will while you have no say in its destiny? If you believe so, I wonder, do you also have a special friend named Canada? At this point, I should address the property of corporations that are not in crony or codependent relationship with governments. Let us say that an old man and an old woman have a little shoe sales slash repair shop and have been running this humble business for years. Lately, the neighborhood has changed, property values have skyrocketed, and their little niche business is expanding daily. They have to hire employees, expand their shop, and have added a little tea shop in the building next door. For years, they have been running their business as a simple, quote-unquote, DBA. But now, their accountant advises them that their business is at great risk if they don't form a corporation to protect it. Their actions to protect their business are morally very different from the actions of a corporation that is dependent upon their relationship with government. If there is or if there is not a magic paper distinguishing the difference between the mom and pop shoe store and some corporations that is the exclusive shoe supplier to the prison industrial complex, there is still a moral difference. The old man and the old woman are reacting to the threat of theft by government or government-assisted entities, whereas the other corporation is facilitating and profiting from that theft. Every moral anarchist should understand this difference in the same way that we understand that it is immoral to rob people to pay for roads, but it is not immoral to use that road once it is built. The difference being active robbery and a reaction to a robbery after the fact. To blame a victim for their reaction to a crime is shifting the responsibility away from the criminal and onto the victim. If I have done my job here, then we can agree that property in the possession of fictional beings is rightfully unowned, in spite of the fact that there are people willing to kill on command for that fictional being. So rightfully, all state property, remember the definition of the state, including the property of governments, their crony churches, their crony corporations, the banking cartels, the mainstream media, all of it is unowned and rightfully open for homesteading. Once homesteaded, the new owner may rightfully do with it as he or she pleases, so long as he or she doesn't initiate aggression on the rightfully owned property of another real person. An example could be a window of a government vehicle. I could homestead it and immediately decide I wanted to break it. Rightfully, I could do so without violating libertarian property rights or without violating the zero aggression principle. However, the odds are the window is protected by a violent nut job that believes in Canada and will shoot me down like a rabid dog, given the opportunity. Yes, he would be the aggressor, and yes, 
I could rightfully protect myself. But remember, wisdom provides the balance between what I can rightfully do and what I should do. Most freedom-loving activists should not engage in violence in support of liberty, even justifiable violence. Most people are not very well endowed to deal with physical and mental challenges and the responsibilities that come with violence. However, the wise activist who is naturally suited for violence but is still dedicated to the zero aggression principle has a choice of the types of activism to be engaged in. Simple sabotage is such a wide field of activism that the friend of freedom can carefully and safely choose the level and type of simple sabotage that best suits their individual situation. On the other hand, ethics-based irregular warfare requires a high level of self-discipline coupled with a very special skill set. Not every gun owner, for example, or former military, in spite of what they may think, is suited for the challenges of the early stages of irregular warfare. Near the end of the life of the state, we may not have the luxury of choosing to be involved in war or not. But today, while we can plan, and the cities have not yet become glowing ashen craters, it is critical that the actions of the irregular warriors be wise, carefully planned, and be executed with extreme caution and secrecy. More specific details on ethics-based irregular warfare and simple sabotage can be found in Sedition, Subversion, and Sabotage Field Manual No. 1 in the section titled Ethics-Based Irregular Warfare and in the section titled Simple Sabotage. Chapter 4, Section 3, The Above Ground and the Underground When the above ground activist considers getting involved in the underground, an old saying applies, discretion is the greater part of valor. If you're not careful in whom you support and what activity you support, you may be taking far more risk than you should. Consider the case of Samuel Mudd, the physician who set the broken leg of John Wilkes Booth. There were very loose connections between Booth and Mudd, and little to no connections between Mudd and the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, and yet, in a frenzy to convict, a military court found Mudd guilty of aiding and conspiring in the murder, and he was sentenced to life imprisonment, escaping the death penalty by one vote. Laurie Fortier may have narrowly escaped a similar fate after the bombing of the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in downtown Oklahoma City on April 19, 1995. Apparently, she helped Timothy McVeigh laminate a fake driver's license that he later used to secure a rental truck that carried a bomb on that fateful day. Any more involvement by Lori is based on conjecture at best. However, rather than see her name railroaded through a kangaroo court and punished for something she had nothing to do with, her husband flipped and became a government stooge. Had he not done so, she may have faced the same unreasonable guilt by association that Mudd had suffered. The hard, ugly lesson being, supporting underground activists can be extremely dangerous. Know who you support and get some kind of idea as to their activities. Otherwise, if they fail or botch their getaway, you may suffer for crimes you had nothing to do with. In the vast majority of situations, the above-ground activists should have no association with the activities of the underground, and at some point in the future even knowing who they are will be extremely dangerous. The best course of action will always be to disassociate yourself from the underground in every way, publicly disavow them, and publicly renounce them, and never allow yourself to have financial connections with them as this will be an easy route the state will use to track down the underground and punish all involved. Chapter 4, Section 3, Part 1 The Sabotage Pincer and the Above Ground Pincer Hackers and friend saboteurs should work to agitate the state by seeking out weaknesses in its security, transportation, manufacturing, and communication infrastructures, then exploiting those weaknesses, if possible, to cause systematic failure or at least confusion. At the point of systematic failure, the hackers and friend saboteurs' work is done, and the above ground becomes the point of agitation by constantly advertising the failures of central planning and forced compliance, while trumpeting the advantages of spontaneous order and peaceful voluntarism. This is the essence of the dual pincers of the scorpion. This type of agitation 
causes the state to overreact, and because of the nature of the state, that overreaction is always some kind of violent authoritarianism. As has been stated over and over, when you only have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, and with the state, that means every problem becomes an opportunity for the state to pound someone. This violent overreaction by authoritarians presents the second opportunity for the above-ground activists to point out the evil nature of government and again advertise the advantages of spontaneous order and peaceful voluntarism. Therefore, if done correctly, every successful action of the hackers and friend saboteurs pays off twice for the above-ground in opportunities to bring shame on those who still support the state and in offering a moral solution. This is the metaphor behind the term Lego Distribution Network. The idea being that as soon as the state is asleep, we slip in and spread Legos on the carpet. Then, in the middle of the night, when the state gets up to go to the bathroom, he will step on them. Hopefully he will stumble and fall down the stairs, but even if he doesn't fall, we will know that we are bringing him pain and aggravation. The above ground and the underground can also work separately to reveal as much information as possible about specific state supporters of aggression. This can involve public revelations of the inner workings of the so-called shadow governments or double governments described by Michael Glennon and discussed later in this manual. These public revelations can include information about how double governments work how politicians are actually powerless and are simply a show for the public, and how foreign and domestic policies are created to control the masses, not to keep them safe. In addition to this critical work, the above ground and the underground can also work separately to veal private and personal information about key figures in the double government so that the stinger of the scorpion can have the sufficient information that it needs to facilitate the decision-making process when a stinging strike is required. The above ground and the underground can be the eyes of the stinger. Of course, the obvious warning has to be inserted here. Whenever the state reacts to the above-described agitation, activists of all kinds should be as far out of reach of the state as possible. This is why invisibility and security are so critical to all components of the underground networks, and it's why the above ground must have no direct ties to the underground. Consider the case of journalist Barrett Brown, who boldly and bravely supported the hacker collective, Anonymous, while writing news releases about their exploits and helping to build a wiki to facilitate analysis of their hacktivism. Even though Barrett never did any hacking, when the U.S. government and its crony cohorts at Stratfor suffered an embarrassing email leak in 2011, Barrett became a convenient whipping boy to be singled out and punished as an example for the rest of us. Journalists like Brown, and others who have suffered even worse for their profession, such as Michael Hastings and Gary Webb, walk a narrow tightrope balancing between their drive to expose the truth and the tendency to become part of the story all the while standing in the open completely exposed to the slings and arrows of the state's fury. But for the rest of the above ground, the best defense against being punished for the actions of the underground is to have no discoverable connections to the underground, and, of course, a consistent public history of denouncing them won't hurt your case either. Chapter 4, Section 3, Part 2 The Stinger Natural Law, Defense, and Aggression I am intentionally being vague in this section of the manual in reference to ethics-based selective irregular warfare, as it is covered more completely and carefully in the section of this manual appropriately named Ethics-Based Selective Irregular Warfare. Among the reasons for being imprecise in this regard, in addition to the obvious reason of avoiding redundancies, is because at some point this manual may be physically divided into its three parts and those who need to read this section will have no need of being associated with those who have a need to read that section. In other words, it may be important for some activists to physically possess a copy of this section of the manual that doesn't contain the other two sections. 
That said, by abandoning the trivium while embracing the Prussian education system, Western governments have systematically stymied the ability of many people to examine an ethical dilemma, break it down to its core questions, and develop a consistent logical solution. For that reason, a simple transitive equation such as the following can confuse some people. If A is greater than B, and B is greater than C, then the equation A is greater than C can be assumed to be true without separate analysis. What one sees when interacting with many otherwise intelligent people is that they have, for example, adopted A is less than C as dogma for a variety of reasons, and can simply not re-examine their position despite the fact that they still agree that A is greater than B and B is greater than C. This is often the source of the problem we face when attempting to explain questions of ethics using grammar, logic, and rhetoric while contradicting tradition and authority. Many otherwise intelligent people simply cannot wrap their minds around concepts that are contradictive to what they have been taught. To put that statement in beer gut terminology, no matter what your mama, your teachers, or some liberty great man told you, what I am about to lay on you is truth. So grab your socks before you get clipped in the neck. There are laws throughout nature waiting to be discovered on an as-needed basis. In and of themselves, they are neither good nor evil. Gravity, for example, is not good nor is it evil. It simply is. We wouldn't say that the man who falls to his death is a victim of evil gravity. That would be absurd. Yet, when we see something that seems to defy natural law, we quickly recognize that something is not quite right, and we tend to want to know why. We literally discover law through investigation and the resulting understanding of how things in nature work. This can be demonstrated by showing a simple sleight of hand trick to a human child or even some other animals. A well-known internet video shows an orangutan viewing a magic trick. The ape is both amazed and humored. The reason he shows such an interest in the trick is because he knows something has happened that seems to defy what he understands to be natural law, and his curiosity drives him to fascination with the phenomenon. All animals have a certain built-in understanding of their role in nature and in the limits of nature. The same goes for the behavior of any animal. The lioness is not evil for providing her cubs with the flesh of a gazelle. She is simply following the law. Her behavior is required to preserve the lives of her offspring. If the gazelle had been able to escape the jaws of the lioness and the cubs had gone hungry, the gazelle would not be considered evil for starving the cubs. The lioness is following natural law, as is the gazelle when it seeks the opposite result of the encounter. In such an encounter, natural law is not contradictive. It is beautifully consistent and a source of life and true peace. Evil, then is what humans perceive when we see natural law violated in an unjust way by a human. Specifically, when one human unjustly uses violence, or threats of violence, on another human, we know this is wrong the same way the orangutan knows there is something not right about the magic trick. The difference being that at times, humans choose to violate natural law through an unjustified violence. And this is why self-defense must enter the equation to fully understand the relationship of natural law and peace. Since self-defense is a reaction of the breaking of natural law, not an original action in and of itself, it is exempt from law, and its execution is at the discretion of the person acting in self-defense. So, for example, if man A initiates violence on man B by punching man B in the nose... We may hope or expect man B to retaliate by punching man A back in return. However, we may not see justification for man B if he sprayed gasoline on man A and set him on fire. Most people would perceive the fire as an overreaction. But do we have the natural right to make that judgment? Did we feel the pain, the fear, the trauma? Have we lived man B's life? Do we know what it means to be man B and be attacked by man A? This is the difference between natural law and civil behavior, and some have argued that is the basis of civil law. 
Natural law says that once man A initiated the confrontation, the judgment of what is a just punishment is rightfully in the hands of man B and he alone. Only man B knows what it is like to be man B and suffer that specific assault by man A. Where civil behavior enters the equation is in the fact that the rest of us may or may not want to live around someone who would burn a man to death over a punch in the nose. So we rightfully may exclude man B from association, but there is nothing in natural law that would condemn man B for his chosen form of retaliation. In the last 5,000 years or so, judgments in civil behavior gave rise to agreements and eventually they became codes of acceptable civil behavior. Eventually, limits were placed both on self-defense and retaliation, and governments became the so-called authority of justice. In the case of Hammurabi's Code, for example, retaliation was unnaturally enforced by government at the arbitrary line of eye for eye, tooth for tooth, bone for bone, and as all government programs tend to do, Agreements in civil behavior became incredibly intrusive laws enforced at the point of a spear, controlling everything from contract law to sexual forbiddances to wage and price controls, and government began dictating punishments that depended upon the social ranking and wealth of the offender and the victim. All of this within the scope of Hammurabi's code. So what we see when we compare natural law with civil behavior is that natural law is never arbitrary, is fair, and always pushes us towards survival of our species, while civil behavior tends to be based on secondary observations by those who have no natural right to judge the matter, and tends to drift towards unfairness and intrusions based on social standing and wealth, where punishments are handed down from government officials. In other words, Civil rules of behavior and second-party judgments must never supersede natural laws and primary party judgments. Otherwise, natural laws get replaced by government edicts, and even the original civil rules become null and void as tyranny replaces freedom, and justice becomes a commodity to be purchased at a government-set price. This leads us to consider self-defense and possibly discover an aspect of natural law. Remember, the aggressive man A and his violent attack on man B? Is it possible that man B's overreaction to the punch in the nose could have been avoided if he spotted the threat man A presented and acted in preemptive self-defense? If man B had recognized man A's intent to punch, and once there was no doubt the event was imminent, if man B had struck first, would man B not have been more evenly tempered to judge the follow-through retaliation against his attacker, having not been subjected to the disorientating effects of the nose punch? In other words, perhaps if man B had acted in preemptive self-defense, there would be no need for the naysayers to wag their fingers in civil judgment of his action because he very likely never would have set man A on fire. In all likelihood, the event would have ended with man A being taught a quick lesson by way of a few bruises, and with man B avoiding humiliation, pain, and the judgment of his peers. Natural law drives the species toward survival, as both men come out better for the encounter. Thus, we see that preemptive violence can be an act of self-defense, and is consistent with natural law. If, on the other hand, Man A simply can't learn this lesson, perhaps we are all better off without him in the gene pool. But that is not for us to judge. It is for his next victim to decide. This leads to our next step in discovering natural law in regards to self-defense. If you have knowledge that a man is stalking your child with the intent to harm her, you are following natural law when you interrupt the man's aggression before he harms your child. And if that man has a history of murdering innocent children, you are under no moral obligation to spare his life in the defense of your child before he has a chance to act. In a situation such as this, preemptive defense is not only wise, but within the natural law definition of ethical action. Many adherents to the zero aggression principle attempt to argue that we may not defend ourselves until after the physical aggression has been initiated by the attacker. 
This is illogical for several reasons. The first of which is that true defense, by its nature, involves the presentation to the potential attacker that the prospect that an attack will have a price, so that the attacker can choose to avoid the confrontation to begin with. Otherwise, we would be considered baiting the attacker if the attacker has the impression that he may have the first strike, quote unquote, free. Remember, almost every dangerous or poisonous animal in nature has clear markings to warn its attackers. After all, in many situations, the attacker who has his first shot free often leaves the victim incapable of self-defense after that first strike. For example, I am about 6 feet tall and weigh about 240 pounds. Additionally, I have trained in personal combat including the European martial art of pugilism. If I, or someone of comparable size and skill, were to get a totally free bare-knuckle first punch in a fight, the fight would likely be instantly over, no matter the size, strength, or training of the victim. That is clearly not a natural law situation that advances our species or promotes peace. So then, natural law provides for preemptive self-defense while remaining within the constraints of the zero aggression principle. Now consider the following. According to the FBI, in 2014, burglary losses in the U.S. topped out at about $3.5 billion. In that same year, according to the Institute for Justice, U.S. quote-unquote law enforcement stole $4.5 billion using asset forfeiture laws. Don't be confused by such a huge number by thinking that massive amounts of money was taken from big-time drug dealers because that didn't happen. The median forfeiture in 2014 was less than $500. Now ask yourself how you would treat a known burglar. If half of all burglars wore distinctive uniforms with a clearly displayed badge indicating they are a burglar, how would you treat them? Would they be safe walking down your street? Would they be safe sitting in a clearly marked car in your neighborhood? Now consider that there were roughly 20,000 no-knock raids in the U.S. in 2014, and that number is rising every year. The largest crime gang in the world already wear uniforms, carry military-grade weapons, and steal more from peaceful people than all of their competitors combined, and that doesn't count what is stolen in taxes and through inflation. The above being the case, if we have clearly demonstrated that a specific institution is based on intimidation, violence, and theft, and if we have demonstrated that specific employees or representatives of that institution have a proven record of using intimidation, violence, and theft to advance that institution and themselves, and if we have demonstrated that said representatives of said institutions are both willing, capable, and at some point in the future, likely to repeat such aggression upon ourselves, our loved ones, or other equally innocent victims, then we are not under obligation to wait until that specific aggressor strikes the first blow against us or our families. If both the institution and the representative of that institution are known to kill the innocent, we have no obligation to limit our use of force when defending ourselves and our family from that aggressor. Actually, much like the lioness above, it is our natural responsibility to preserve our family and remove threats before they can do harm. And, like the law of gravity, the natural law of self-defense cannot be logically described as evil. It simply is. Back to beer gut terminology. They are in our towns. They are in our neighborhoods. And they are daily entering our homes and having their way with our property and our loved ones. They don't think we can or will do a thing about it. But they are wrong. We can and we will stop them. But we must do it wisely. We cannot foolishly play into their hands through open confrontation.